say good morning for those in our viewing audience and for those who are attending, who are viewing us online. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are going, we're in, our study is going to come from Acts chapter 21. Uh, for uh, this study, we're in Acts chapter 21. Uh, Brother Wendell did a really good job kind of setting it up. And so we're just going to kind of finish up the latter parts of chapter 21. And before we get started, we just kind of want to highlight some items to give uh, some historical context of what's going on in um, in uh, this time, this place in the world in Judea and why Paul is so intent on heading to Jerusalem. So if anybody have your Bibles available, can I get uh, can I get someone to get Jonah 3, 23, 11, and Romans 11, verse 22. Uh, Romans 11, verse 22, and Jonah 3, 11. I know one of the reasons Paul is so intent on heading to Jerusalem, it goes back into Acts chapter 9 when Christ, Jesus Christ made this proclamation to Paul when he was traveling on the road to Damascus in verse, in chapter, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And this is the Lord uh, answering um, Ananias, just giving Ananias some insight about why he chose Paul. So this is the beginning of, this is going to be kind of the combination in the earmarks of Paul's ministry. So in verse 15, it says, but the Lord said unto him, talking to Ananias before he went to Paul, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we see, like Paul is heading to Jerusalem as we read, uh, continue our study in Acts chapter, uh, and, and the rest of the book of Acts, we see that Jerusalem is going to be the gateway to Rome and that later on he's going to appear be uh, before Augusta and King Agrippa and then Paul is going to make his appeal to Caesar. So I know that when you read in Acts chapter 20, um, 21 and they talk about Paul, all Paul is telling individuals you won't see my face again and that Paul is going to Jerusalem and all these things and the brethren are heartbroken about it. And sometimes if we don't understand the context, you're like, why is Paul insisting on going to Jerusalem for all these things away? A lot of it was because this is the prophecy that Jesus made about Paul and his ministry, that this is a part of his work. And so he's not going just to put himself in danger and things like that, but he's going to do the work. He's going to do the work that God called him to do, and he's going to embrace that prophecy that was kind of made about him. He's going to embrace that, those suffering. He's going to embrace these trials and tribulations that come along with walking the Christian journey that has been laid out him as foretold in his prophecy from Jesus to Christ. And another element we want to look at, can I get uh, Jonah, the reader for Jonah chapter 3, verse 11? Yeah, it's just a point. Yeah, it doesn't go, but I just want to show about the fact that uh, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And what? Is John, it's not John. Is it 511? Is it 511? It's a, sorry. I was making my notes. Thank you, Brother Bob. It's a, it's the last uh, verse in the book of John. It's the last verse in the book of John. Yeah, yes, that's it. John of 411. Thank you. John of 411. Whereas our Lord yeah, I think when we look at Jonah, and I just wanted to pull that Old Testament scripture out to say that God cares about people. It's the goodness of God not to let people stay in the condition where they're in. Of course, there's going to be judgment about wickedness, and there's a duality with God that he will punish unrighteousness, right? But we know and we see through 
see God work in the Old Testament all the way to the New is that he, in all punishments, in all judgments that's going to be enacted, he gives man a way out. He gives man a sense of redemption. So that's that redeeming aspect that's going on here as well, because the destruction of Jerusalem has already been prophesied, right? Uh, can I get someone to get me... Um, Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. The destruction of Jerusalem has already been prophesied, right? But even in that destruction, you can go back to Genesis talking about the destruction of the, the flood that has been that was foretold that God was going to send his flood. He always gives man a way out. And so we just want to acknowledge that, yes, Paul is going to go into a very trying, a very challenging situation, but there are other elements at play here as well is that there's the destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus has foretold, but also this nature of God that even when destruction is proclaimed or judgment is proclaimed, his goodness gives man a way out. So kind of get that reader for um, Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. Speak of the temple. I was adorned with cutting stones and gifts. He said, As for these things, but ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone from another, there shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, what when shall these things be? And what signs will there be that these things shall come to pass? Yeah. Um also can I get a reader for Matthew chapter twenty three? verses 34 through 38. Matthew chapter 23 verses 30, 34 through 38. I think the prophets wisely described that some of them ye shall kill and crucify and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Yeah, so when we see these statements, um, it's about kind of pulling everything together to show that God will designate his some servants to go, God, God has designated servants to go and teach the people, right? It's because he cares about the state of it. And also, not that he doesn't care about the people that he's sending forward. That's his great love and care because he's sending people he care about, that he loves. But unfortunately, they're going to be persecuted just like his son. There's going to be persecution of going and teaching people, right? But a lot of one thing we got to keep in mind is that our persecution, or the persecution that Paul is dealing with and the persecution that uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 and 34 is talking about the prophets he sent, the wise man he sent, the scribes he sent, even the apostles that he sent, right? He's sending them for a purpose, right? And like he's like kind of thinking about the scripture in Jonah, right? I am saved. These apostles, it's the idea of trying to save as many people as possible. Like that's really the goal, right? Just like Noah was back in the days in the pre flood area preaching and teaching as much as he can, trying to save souls. And so when we kind of bring all of these elements together, we can understand and kind of embrace the persecution that's going to arise. And we see Paul embracing this persecution and not shying away from it because he understands that judgment is coming, right? And no one will be able to escape this judgment the Jews' religion as it stands, the temple, all those things are going to be wiped away. 70 AD is coming. There is not a date that's foretold, but Jesus already prophesied that the destruction of Jerusalem is going to be intimate, intimate. And so that's what you see. Paul is embracing this journey. He's going there as has been foretold in old times that God is not going to just leave people in their undone state. He's always going to reach out to them. Yes, don't go I have no pleasure 
in the death of the wicked. Definitely. So, you know, the Lord always moves that way. He, he calls them shadow shadows. They save those, even though when come time where if they don't turn, then they're going to face this judgment. Yeah, they're going to face this judgment. And, like, you know, and, you know, when we see people, um, it's, it's, you know, it's trying to adopt the perspective at, of Christ, right? And, and just using parents, for example, right? I can see my kid doing something and it could be bad and I can, I want, they need chastisement, right? But I will always be like, you know, you know, they're growing, they're maturing, they need help. Yes, we need to hold them accountable, but I can see some mine else kids. Like, what? You know, you won't extend the same graciousness, right? But you think about that term when it says God the Father, right? It's the idea of seeing people in sin, seeing people in this undone condition, acknowledging the wrong that they're doing, but also extending that grace. Extend that grace because the idea is... Sorry, go ahead, Brother Andy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Boy, man. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, that, yeah, that's all. Amen. Not correcting his kids, just like Eli in the Old Testament, not correcting his kids. But it's the idea that there is grace, but there has to be accountability as well. And and so what, what we see um in the scriptures is that there is accountability, but there is that element of grace, that du that dual nature of God. So if you have your Bibles, um this is kind of the last scripture that we're going to look at before we jump into our lesson, uh, Acts 11, 22. Um, and Paul here is talking about the Gentiles not to be haughty as they're coming into the kingdom, uh, but to, this is like the branches being grafted in. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, Romans 11, 22. Romans 11, 22. Oh, this is um this is the last scripture. It's coming from Romans. Romans eleven twenty two. For the goodness of the severity of God, and them which fail severity, but more the goodness continue in the Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Yeah, so that good means that severity that the wicked will be not count, right? Well, the good you are by his grace. And that grace is being obedient to his word, being obedient to what he has revealed in the scriptures, then your salvation is you have a weight, right? And so so many times God is either vilified as this unpleasing, authoritative, just looking to punish, or that he is uh portrayed as all loving with no backbone, with no element of accountability. Right? But we want to make sure we kind of advocate the proper perspective, right? He has all power. He has all authority, but there's a duality to his nature. Severity for his punishing sin and unrighteousness, but also goodness to give people a space and time to repent. So, uh, so just want to give that backdrop as we look into... Uh, get into our, our lesson for us in uh, Acts chapter 21. So can we uh, go ahead and pull that up on the screen? Acts, go ahead, Brother Andy. Yes, yes, there, there, there is a, accountability. There is, there is accountability, and I think that's one of the things that we want to look at in this uh, aspect of the truth, right? Is that accountability, which um, is kind of something that we kind of want to focus on. So uh, for our lesson, uh, we can bring up the slides. We're going to start in uh, Acts chapter uh, 21, starting at verses 18 through the uh, rest, of the, rest of the chapter. All right. And this is just Paul going back into Jerusalem. Uh, give an account of his ministry and the things that he done according to the Gentiles just to make sure the brothers are encouraged and they, they are aware. Oh, no slide. 
Okay. Uh, we have having di technical difficulties with the slides, but no worries. We just can like follow along with the scripture. It's nice to have technology, but God's word is really all that we need. And so um, as we look in like verses 18 through uh, 19, 17 through 19, um, we just see Paul going into James and to the elders, saluting them and giving them that under kind of letting them know about his ministry among the Gentiles, the success, the baptism, the churches. So he's just giving us a report. I know in our modern age with technology, um, it doesn't like resonate the same, right? Back in this time, all they had was letters and they didn't have the postal system as we are. So Paul is going and giving an account, right? And one thing that we kind of want to hit about is that, uh, I know Brother Mike and Brother Greg and Brother Bob, people who've been seasoned in the church, they can kind of speak to this as well. When you have people transitioning from a religious system into the truth, they still have great affection for that religion, right? And you see that, and they you're trying to get them to understand that this is the truth, right? But they have this affection for this. It's almost like if it's not so much doctrinal, but they have a culture, like the Jews had a culture of religion, a culture that was mixed with their religion that they are having a hard time moving away from, right? They have turned their customs and traditions into doctrine. And so uh, the they're having a hard time trying to move from that space. And you see, like, Paul is coming and coming to Jerusalem, to the epicenter of where the Judaizers' teachers originate. He's going to Jerusalem where all, like, you look at Acts chapter 5, what that, Acts chapter 15, where that doctrine of circumcision kind of originated. It came from Jerusalem, the Judaizing teachers. It's like these are where these, this, the Jewish religion forced a stronghold. So Paul is going there. And some of these individuals have become members of the Lord's body, but they aren't, haven't been completely converted for their understanding of the scripture and what was the purpose of the Old Testament law. And so they still have this affection and they are in a transitional period and they are still holding on to a lot of their customs, right? And Paul, he has completely transitioned. I know in the business world, we hear this term early adopter. Like Paul has completely made that transition from Judaism to Christianity. He's not trying to bring anything along. He's not trying to tell people like, you need to keep those customs and those holy days and those circumcision. Like Paul is, has completely left all those things behind. He has moved on from that system of faith, right? But then you get here, and you're dealing with James, right? And then you, then James has something to say uh, about some of the misunderstanding that the Jews are having regarding the things that Paul has been teaching, right? And then, like I say, and when he saluted them, so in verse 19, when he saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had brought among Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, heard and, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews, which are them which believe, and they are all zealous for the law. He's not talking here about the law of Christ, but he's talking about the old law, the law of Moses. And 21 is kind of the kicker, right? And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all Jews, which are among the Gentiles, are the dispersion to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is therefore the multitude needs to come together for? For they will hear that thou art come. Do for this we say to thee, we have four men. As you read down into uh, verse uh, 27, James is trying to help Paul. But in my opinion, James is has good intentions, but this is not what Paul really should be doing, right? Now, they hear these things about Paul. James knows that this is not what, James knows the intent and the reason why Paul is doing these teachings. He's not trying to upset their, 
their culture, trying to do away with these things. He just says these has no religious value anymore under the New Testament. And so James is trying to get Paul to take a course of action to alleviate all those riots, all those conflicts, all that chaos that has been following Paul continually from city to city. And what we want to kind of highlight is that is that the Bible tells us to try to be at peace with all men. And it's nice to try, but it's not always uh, able to be accomplished, right? And a lot of readers, a lot of commentators, it kind of get caught up in this aspect of saying like, why is Paul going along with James and trying to go through these purification rites to try to appease the Jews in certain ways, right? The thing about it is that not that Paul is confused or being drawn back into the system of uh, uh, Judaism, is that Paul is kind of trying to go along with James and try to make peace, right? He's trying to make peace, right? But sometimes we as Christians, when we are holding on to the truth, there really is not peace that can be made when it's a matter of doctrine, right? I don't know if anybody has any uh, comments regarding that, right? We can try to be peaceful, but there is a conflict that will arise when we are standing on the truth and the people are opposing the truth, right? And we as brothers and sisters, we should not try to encourage, discourage people or encourage people to lessen their message to try to um, not cause conflict, right? Now, what we could do, what James could have did, is that those that camp of Jewish Christians that had that affiliation is misrepresenting Paul in regards to the law of Moses. He could have bridged them together, right? Instead of trying to have Paul compromise himself. Not, I shouldn't say compromise, so that's too hard a word, to try to humble himself and try to adopt these customs and cur to say, like, look, Paul, Paul display that you're still a good Jew and that these things are untrue, but James knew they were untrue. It was just being misrepresented. Even though this Jew does not believe Christ is God and is not a temple, I just believe that somehow, you know, looking in heaven as well, due to the fact that God's going to somehow get him to the church and say all of that things. Wow, I'm just going to And he said, John 14, 6, will not allow that. And go there to the Jew, he says, the only way to God is through Christ. That's it. He says, and I'm sorry to tell you, he says, well, I'm sorry. You're not lost. I'm lost. If you don't come to the Father through Christ, Christ is the only way. Well, it went from Solomon there. You know, he got up and he was like, hey, he, he said he wanted to apologize. Yeah. yeah. That brother had And the brother got back up and said, I'm going to apologize for telling the truth. He said, I'm in the East on that stage. And so it's kind of like what you're talking about. He can't compromise the truth. You know, we wanted to be more quick. Yes. Now I was a teaching tour. True is a thing. Yes. And I don't care how you can get a lot of things hard to mind because it's kind of complicated for me. Make sure anyone who knows holds it, anyone, people say, well, I don't like confrontation. I don't like it. Yes. I don't know who likes it, but that is. You know, we're not standing where you need to stand because somehow those prophets of God, those men of the New Testament, they couldn't avoid conflict, they couldn't avoid persecution. That's it. And Jesus himself didn't avoid it by having the truth to the Jews. I don't know how he was supposed to love the conflict. In regard to the scripture and the word of God, that, that, that there will be conflict unless people will. Align themselves with it, Brother Wendell. Yeah, just think, oh, uh, Matthew 10 
that they not want to come to see the peace on earth. I came not to say peace, but a sword. Yeah, that, that peace is a that peace, but a sword. And so, um, go ahead, brother Bob. Yeah, that, that peace, but a sword. But that's again, we as Christians can live in academia instead of practicality, right? So when that starts, stuff starts happening, and brothers are teaching the truth. Do we as Christians try to censor talk or censor them? And that's the thing about it. It's the censoring aspect of the gospel. Go ahead, Brother Bob. Couple is when you read Paul, I get sometimes confused on is he following Jewish laws or not? Yeah. So when you look at it, it's never doctrinal issue. No. It's always tradition, such as yes. uh, examples would be we're still praying from eating meats of the idols or having Timothy and Titus circumcised. Yeah, yeah. Those are not doctrinal issues, yeah. but they are tools that helped him give up his liberties to influence others. Yeah, so I did like what I was talking about as uh, Timothy is circumcised, right? Because Timothy is, his, his mother is a Jew, his father was, and he knew culturally that would cause problems for Timothy because of the Jewish culture, right? It's not to cause offense in the gospel. He didn't circumcise Timothy to be saved, right? But also in Galatians 2, verses Galatians chapter 2 and verse 3, when, when they was having that big issue about should the Gentiles be circumcised, Titus was not circumcised. Paul would not stand for that because. Timothy, a different, that's your culture, and we are trying not to call offense. We are trying to be humble, right? But if you make this a doctrinal issue, Titus is not getting circumcised. This is not going to happen. So you see those things in Scripture. So that distinction is of sometimes Paul is doing things from a cultural perspective, trying to not give offense to a certain amount of people, right, based on their culture, because Timothy not being circumcised would cause an uproar with the Jews. The Gentiles not being circumcised won't have that same problem. So trying to navigate these cultural perspectives, which is definitely in the scriptures, is definitely something that we have some nuances that we have to in our study deal with. But the idea here is that a bigger idea is not censoring your brethren, right? And also, we have brothers that got a lot of fire in their soul. You know that they not gonna you not gonna be censored. <laughs> so don't even try to allow them to go there, right? And some brothers have a false reputation, like he preached too hard and he's negative. And I I heard Brother Moser, he was teaching one time. He was like, they always tell me I'm yelling when I'm teaching, tell me to stop and why you never let that brother teach. We should not be dealing with one another for us trying to censor one another. Let the brothers teach. And also it just talks to like if there are certain brothers who have that fire, and that fire is not going to be suppressed. So be nice to people who try to help you avoid conflict, but go forth and teach. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So I like to say he understood what Yes, it. That's it. Wow. She was not able to love and come together in Christ to a prayer. And that's that unity, even though there may be some things that you do. That's it. That that Gentile couldn't do, otherwise you might see it in soul do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, no and that was the comment I was gonna make go back to Corinthians where Paul said I've become all things to all men. He said to the Jew, I became a Jew. Yeah, what Paul was a Jew. Yeah, what did he mean by that? But um there's debate about this. And I don't think we're ever going to agree. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, one thing we can agree on is we know what Paul said. And that's the thing. We have to teach. 
problem. But not intentionally going to do anything in the way contrary to the God or God's will. Exactly. He makes it just can't, you know, debate about this is one where it will cause problems. It's because we don't have anything where the Holy Spirit is condemning. Yeah, we're not condemning. So we just got to go with what we read and what the result of it was. Yeah, like you said, um, the one thing in the aspect of all this is the destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews view Jerusalem like Islam view Mecca, right? Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. You're not going to be able to come here. This place of worship is going to be completely removed. So if you don't condition yourself and your faith to your faith to be in the Christ and in his doctrine, when something like this happens, it's going to wipe you out, right? You think about Christians who faith was surrounded in a building and coming together. Once COVID hit, it done. Done. You're used to a place and, and, and your faith is built and sustained by this place instead of your faith being where it's supposed to. So when something happens and, that's, and that disruption occurs, you'll see people face just take a nosedive. There's a lot of things that went to Jerusalem Temple was destroyed. We end up in the hand up building back in the city. Yeah. So it's all better than I have. Yeah, they like to say, um, and that's the idea for the Jews. It's like, could you imagine those Jewish Christians? They they, they never saw it coming, even though in the Old Testament, uh, Babylon destroyed the temple, that place where they want to trust in. Like, no, your faith is misplaced. It's like uh, some of us have come out of different religions. Yeah. yeah. Mother-in-law, she was number one. 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 We even do stuff like this. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, when you look at the first thing you do is not talk. And that's what you don't see here. And like you say, um, um, Paul, there's, there's ample evidence of the letters, the epistles to show where Paul's mindset was, right? And like I say, an idea that he tried. He tried to avoid that conflict. Then you look at, read down to uh, verse 28, right? Um um, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 27, right after he tried to purify himself in verse 26, uh, verse 26, that Paul took men and the next day purified himself with them to enter the, into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of the purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. In verse 27, right after, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men in Israel, help. This man is that teaching all men everywhere against the people and against the law and this place and further brought Greeks into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Right? You tried all that you did, and it's commendable to try to have peace, but this action did not result in the peace that you're looking for, right? Because you're not dealing with peaceful people. You're not dealing with people who are going to align in the scripture. The scripture has already told us how we handle conflict with one another to go to people. And you see these type of actions consistently in all aspects of society where they're not looking. It's this mob thing, right? For those of us who are Christians, we allow the scriptures to be the determining factor. People of the world get their validation from numbers, right? They're always trying to build consensus, and they think that just because the majority of people say a certain thing, that that gives it validation and credibility. It's like, no, it doesn't, right? And you see all this turmoil that arises, and we just got to be mindful of Christians that when things land with us, 
this is not the appropriate way. And churches can split and divide because people will not humble themselves and do it. They'll get emotionally charged, and then they will just cause ruckus and riot. Teach them that that's the law and sacrifice is trouble. Because our Lord saved the king, and when he died upon that cross, all that was trouble. No, but they still think that they, they still place native religion on the angel. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, you can see here. That Paul associated with Gentiles lets you know that he had completely separated himself. Because, like you said, when when uh, Peter went to talk to Cornelius, one of the things said is Peter told Cornelius that it's unlawful for a Jew to have any relations or any interactions with a Gentile, even to come under their roof, right? And not that it was God's law, right? Because any separation with us is going to have to be based upon righteousness, not your culture, not your ethnicity or nationality, is going to be on righteousness and unrighteous, right? And so, but you see these people, it's not that Paul is trying to disallow the law of Moses because the Old Testament scriptures is what the early church had, right? The New Testament was still uh, being compiled, still being written, so what they had was the scrolls, the Old Testament scrolls. And so not that Paul is trying to do away with anything, right? He's doing away with their customs and the incorrect mindset, but he's mainly teaching them like this was the purpose of the law. You can look in Romans, you can look in Galatians. Over and over again, he's addressing the Old Testament law and trying to align the Jews. Same thing Christ did. Was like, you have heard it say it. Like, no, I need to teach you how to correctly understand and apply the scriptures, right? So. Yeah, yeah. You're right. And one of the things. The truth will cause conflict, right? You can try to do all you can to make peace at people, but let that conflict be in accordance with the word and being taught. And it takes great courage upon ourselves to separate ourselves from our culture, right? A lot of times we can identify, you know, like identify as African-American, identify as this. And when you're in your own culture and you start bringing people the truth, right? Having that feel and losing that camaraderie, losing that affection with your own culture is very big to appropriately submit yourself in Christ, right? Like you can call me, African American call me black, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, I'm a Christian, right? Our values, my values, are always going to align with members of the Lord's body, right? No matter that. See, that's where my values are going to align. Not that I don't have affection for my culture, my affection for my race, but that affection will not supersede the Word of God. And so that's one thing we got to like see in Paul, and you can see it in Romans chapter ten. His heart bled. He wanted to bring the gospel to his people, but they are rejecting him and they're rejecting the message. But even in that rejection, he did not compromise the truth, right? Too many times we as people say we don't like conflict, and that is untrue. We'll fight over everything. We'll fight over Christmas. We'll fight over TV. We'll fight over Netflix. We'll fight over every single thing, which who to name, what to name our kids, where to live, where to work. It, you'll fight over every single thing, right? You'll fight over the Christmas budget. You'll fight over the birthday. I didn't get what I want. You will fight. And we will just let it be known. But we will not engage and accept these fights regarding the scriptures. We'll break up whole families over some foolishness. But it's not our families being separated because you refuse the gospel. Right? I'm going to worship over here now versus over here. I'm associating myself with a new group of people. I'm lining myself over here, right? So that's where the fight has. Not that the fight doesn't take place. It doesn't take place in the right thing. But it's wrong. Exactly. Uh, you were talking about um, Paul's 
fault or infringement and be interjected. But did it make me think that Jesus said they did it to me first? Mm -hmm. And I was going somewhere with that book now. Yeah, sorry. And like I say, it, it, it's not about reading the scriptures, but when you start living this out and you start feeling that separation, you start living that separation and you start being isolated, you start being marginalized by your culture or your society and your family, then what will you do, right? A lot of people just go back into wherever they are, stop going to church or go back to where they are because to walk in that feeling and embrace it, getting used to that space, is very difficult for certain people, right? Because they want that affection. Take those uh, trips and see, uh, talk about fight for this, fight for this, fight for this. And then I'm coming to religion. Yeah. It's like a fighter. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 They stand with it. They stand with it. They stand where I was talking with it. Yeah. You know, you're right there right now. Talking about it. Yeah, they would even take a stand there, but then we take a stand for what Christ said for scripture, the, the truth. Yeah, that when it becomes quote unquote a fight. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I tell people it's it's not a it's not, it's a it's a easy choice, but it's a difficult choice. It's like a duality, right? Um, like I tell people, like why are you here? I say because the word. Because when I was deployed, my family would always talk about y'all and the word. And we were in places where the word wasn't proclaimed. It was compromised, not for the revealing the whole truth. Certain subjects weren't taught. The brothers weren't as committed or dedicated. I love them, but I didn't realize it until I came here and I heard that truth. I was like, we're not getting that there. We're not getting this there. That's not being taught there. And so I wrote on my orders. And it, like I said, it's not to elevate me. It's the gospel. I just tell my orders, Virginia, and they say, what do you like about Virginia? I said, I know nothing about it. Pretty much don't want to be here. Uh, but the truth is here. The truth is proclaimed. So I deal with whatever else I need to deal with because the gospel is here. Uh, for a year, I heard my family talk about all the sermons, and we would just had all these great discussions about it, and I didn't have to pull them. I wasn't like, did you go today? Well, what did you know? They were freely overflowing and gushing with the word. And I was like, I haven't seen this before and I need to take advantage and I need to stay here and grow. And so I was like, okay, the gospel, what about, I don't know nothing about nothing. I don't know. I haven't met him before. I only went, I really don't know him all that well, except what they, my family has said. So I uh, just, it's, it's the gospel. I couldn't explain it. All I knew is that the gospel was being preached. I saw four people and my mother, well, my mother-in-law included just invigorated and on fire and enthused in the word. And I'm just like, I, it didn't it, it, it settle. People like you coming back to Mississippi or Georgia? No, I'm 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 here. That that's it. Is the truth that that well? Well, yes, yes. It impacted everything that I knew, and so like you say, like I said, I'm making it kind of light of it, but I had no other answer for anybody else except the gospel. I just I heard about Red Cross, Ballast, Thorn, Disney. I heard all that for a year when I was deployed, and so I was like. I, know, I feel like I know them. I don't never met them, but I hear about them. I'm getting their books and Eric Owens and, and Michael Brandt and all these people. I'm just like, okay, like I, this is where I am. And like I say, um, it's the gospel and it's the truth that's going to motivate and lead our decisions, right? And like I say, it brought us into conflict and people like, you're going to make it down. We, we're here. You can come visit us. So, like I said, it, and not to make light of the situation, but it's the gospel, and we make those decisions based on Christ. And the conflict did arose, it continues to arise, but we've made our stance on the gospel, right? And the, the light of Christ that's in this congregation, and the faith and the conviction of the brothers and sisters here is what keeps us, and it's, it's the best place I've ever been stationed. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, yeah, so, and, and like I say, it's, it's about the truth and, and living the truth and dealing with whatever comes up. So, uh, thank you for your time. Um, we didn't get through all the slides, but that kind of wanted to hit those key points about standing on the truth and kind of embracing the conflict that the word encourages. So, 
All right, uh, we're going to just end it here and to uh, go get ready for our worship at 11.